When I got up this morning And I saw a new day I said one more blessing, Lord, that you sent my way. Amen. Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 and 21. There you shall find these words recorded for your listening as they have been translated in the English Standard Version. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and, I, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And just for a little while, I'm going to put a tag on this text and talk on this topic with your help and uh, with yours and the Holy Ghost's help. If because and regardless Christians if because and regardless a Christian we know them very well we work with people who for all professional purposes, many of them are if, because, or regardless, co-workers. We study with them on campuses. There are students who are if, because, or regardless, students. Veterans, you served alongside them in your units, in your battalions, you have if, because, and regardless, soldiers. In your family, y'all gonna help me today? You got if, because, and regardless, members of your family. So it shouldn't be too surprising that in our church fellowships, in our church families, we have if, because, and regardless Christians. Uh, because there's something about us is that we want to be treated in an unconditional way. But when it comes to the treatment that we have to give, we always know how to place conditions. And many times those conditions uh, turn out to be if something is going the way we want it to go, because something is favorable or unfavorable. Um, but there are a minority of individuals that say regardless to what goes on, how it goes on, who's involved, I'm going to be a part and give it my wholehearted commitment. For these are the kinds of people that God is really looking for. And all of us have to make a personal evaluation. Those here and you online, you got to make a personal evaluation of which one, which category, which crowd you're going to be a part of. The if crowd, because the if crowd, everything is contingency based. If something goes the way you want it to go or the way you like it to go or if it's comfortable for you, you're all in. But if something does not go the way you want it to go, if the stars don't align for you, if the mood isn't right, if there's a piece or two missing, our faithfulness is in question. Then there are the because people. Well, I just do it because I'm obligated 
to do it. I just do it because the expectation has been set for me to do it. I just do it because my mama did it. I just do it because my ministry leader asked me to do it. Uh, these are the just because, not the just because kind of people, but the because kind of people. But God is not looking for if Christians. God is not looking for because Christians. God is looking for regardless people. Those kind of people that it's not too far, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's not too early, it's not too late. You know, when you get an invitation as African Americans, somebody sends you an, African, uh, an invitation, a link to some event or activity, one of the first questions we ask, who's going to be there? Y'all going to talk to me today? Regardless of who's there, regardless of who's not there, we're going to take it upon ourselves to be involved in whatever activity that God has assigned for us. Because that is what we want from God. We don't want God to treat us in an if category. If you go to church like you're supposed to. If you go to Bible study like you're supposed to, if you pray every day, if you give your gifts, tithes, and offerings like as you're supposed to, then you will bless me. Or we don't want God to operate according to our because. Well, I'm going to do it, God, because you answered my prayer. Because there are some of us who have prayed some prayer, and they have not currently come to pass. There are some of us in the because category because God didn't do something. Y'all not going to talk. Because God didn't do something that you petitioned or you prayed for him to do, you clap back at God. And you refuse to do or purposely omit to do that which he expects you to do. Uh, sisters and brothers, you can always hold God accountable because God said what he would do in his word. And so the balance of trust is we are ahead. The balance of trust suggests that everything from a spiritual perspective, is almost in our favor. It's lopsided because we can count on God. But the question today is, can God count on us? Are we like Jacob or are we more like Jesus? Here in this particular passage of scripture, we've for a few chapters in Genesis, learned about the descendants of Abraham. Abraham's promised son was named Isaac. Isaac had two children by his wife, Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob, fraternal twins. Uh, it had been revealed to Jacob in a vision, and to Isaac, rather, in a vision that as far as the promise that was given to his father Abraham, the promise that was given to him, the younger son, which was uncharacteristic in their culture, would lead or rule over the older son. Usually the firstborn son would take over uh, the family legacy. Uh, the firstborn son would carry on the family name and the family business and all of that, but uh, through a strange series of events that many of you are familiar with, uh, it didn't quite happen in that way. Yeah. Jacob was the younger fraternal twin. Yeah. He was named Jacob. Jacob means supplanter. At other times, it means heel grabber. Because when Esau came out, the infant Jacob had grabbed on his heel, and then when they pulled 
Esau out, and when his mother, Rebekah, pushed him out, Jacob was right behind, holding on to his brother's heel. And he was named Jacob. And Jacob lived up to his name all of his life. Heel grabber, supplanter, which brings us to our text today. Here it is, because through a series of events, Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, had st literally stolen the birthright that supposedly was automatically to be handed over to Esau uh, by their father Isaac. When Isaac was old, his vision was compromised. We don't know. He had cataracts. There was no treatment for that then. We don't know if he had glaucoma. There was no treatment for that then or no diagnosis for it either. But he had trouble seeing to the point he was almost blind. So he had a comfort food, a favorite dish that his son Esau would make because he was an outdoorsman. He was the one that did the hunting and the fishing and stayed out in the field while Jacob was a homeboy, a homebody. He did things around the house. Esau was his father's favorite. Jacob was his mother's favorite. And they played a trick. On, on Isaac at Esau's expense. Uh -huh. yeah. Rebecca, Jacob's mother, uh, had learned that Isaac asked Esau to go out, kill a deer, make me some of that good venison stew that you making, and bring it back, and then I'm going to confer my blessing onto you. I'm getting old now. I don't know how long it's going to be. I know my days are numbered, but before I go, I'm going to bless you like my father blessed me. And so Esau got up, picked up, packed up, and went out to do what his father had requested him to do. And, his, and their mother, Rebecca, got busy. First of all, if you go to Genesis chapter 26, verse 34, it won't be on screen, but it's for you to look at later. Jacob's parents, Isaac and Rebecca, disliked the choice of women that Esau had, had made. Esau had taken on two wives of the Hittite women, the Canaanite women, and as I paraphrase, they were dramatic. <laughs> you, read it for your, you read it for yourself, Genesis 26 and 34, that both Isaac and Rebecca couldn't stand them. I mean, they, they were loud. They were indignant. They were wretched. Uh, they, they were unsavory. And to the point where they were just shaking their head over their daughter-in-laws. And Rebecca said, whatever you do, don't get you none of them Hittite women like your brother because it, it'll kill your poor mom. They all, they, the, I can't take one more Hittite woman. Well, I'm going to send you away into the place where my family resides and find you a wife there. And when the coast is clear after she had dressed him up to be like her, his brother. She had fixed the dish that Jacob had requested from Esau, sent him in with the dish, and even Isaac was like, how you get back so fast? It usually take you half a day to go out and hunt and kill the game and prepare it and then to serve it to him. How you get back so fast? And he like, come here. He's like, and he came and he's like, hmm. He said, let me feel your hands. She had put some, some fur on his hands because Esau was a rugged guy. He was, he was a hairy fellow. And he was like, is that my son Esau? Yeah, daddy. He said, you, 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 you say you're my son Esau, but you sound like Jacob. He said, he said come here, let me smell your neck. <laughs> He's like, you say you're my son Esau, but you smell like Jacob. And then he felt the hairy hands. 
And I guess Isaac subscribed to it and said, oh well. And so he ate the food, he was satisfied. He said, you outdid yourself. This was good. And so he conferred the birthright onto Jacob, believing it to be Esau. Deception at its best. But this deception had an overarching purpose because again, it had been promised that the elder would serve the younger. And so no sooner than Jacob and his mother's plan came to pass and Jacob went on his way, Esau returns to do exactly what his father had asked him to do, prepare his dish, serve it to him. And he's like, Esau, wasn't you just here? Whose who stew did I just eat? And Esau was mad, the Bible says. He said, I didn't bless your, if it wasn't you, it must have been your brother. I blessed your brother. Even to the point where Esau said, Father, do you have a blessing for me? He said, no, I blessed your brother. You got to serve your brother when I'm dead and gone. And it is said in the Bible that Esau said, yeah, daddy going to be dead soon. I'm paraphrasing and we're going to have a good funeral. We're going to put them away nice. And when the period of mourning is over, I hope mama got another plot. Because I'm going to kill Jacob. I'm going to kill Jacob. And Rebecca was aware of this, so she, she sends him away to her brother Laban so that he could get established, get on his feet, find a wife and all that stuff, making him promise. Whatever you do. Don't get you no Hittite women. Them Hittite women must have been something else. Because I don't want to see, I can't stand, I, can't, I don't want to bear with or tolerate another Hittite woman. So go get you a wife among our people. And so Jacob sojourns and goes away. As he travels, he lodges for the night out in the field, takes a rock, uses it as a pillow, lays his head on it, and he has a dream that we call Jacob's Ladder, or a ladder extended from earth to heaven. The Lord stood on top of the ladder. Angels ascended and descended upon the ladder. And the Lord spoke to him and gave him a promise that, similar to what he gave to Abraham, similar to what he gave to, to his father Isaac. He said, I'm going to bless you like the sands on the shore like the stars in the sky. You, your, 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 your offspring are going to be numerous and the world is going to be blessed because of you. Jacob was so enamored in this dream, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And he called that place El Bethel, which in Hebrew means the house of God. And so he woke up from his sojourn and went about his way. And in the process of him realizing all the wonderful things that he had seen and heard, he makes this vow in our text, if God. So Jacob was an if God and a because God kind of believer. God promised him in Genesis 28 and 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That should have settled the whole matter for Jacob right there. But a few verses later, in our text, his response was, if God will be with me. God already said he was going to be with you. Some of us just can't take God at his word. We have to always put God to the test. We have to always, in Jesus' manner of speaking, tempt God. God, if you do this, God, if you do that, then I'll do what I'm supposed to do. God, if you do what you're supposed to do, then I'm going to do 
what I'm supposed to do. If you will be with me, if you will keep me in this way that I go, if you will give me food to eat, if you will give me clothes to wear, if you bring me back safely to my father's house, then, then you'll be my God. God, you got a lot of work to do for me to devote myself to you. And it's not lost on me that I could be talking to somebody who's has some Jacob-like tendencies here today. First of all, let's look at what, God, what Jacob says. Jacob is asking for God's presence to surround him. That's what we need. We need God's presence to surround us. If God will be with me. That's what we need. God's abiding presence. David realized that the Lord is ever present with us. David put it like this, I can run away from family, I can run away from friends, but how, how am I going to run away from God? He said, where, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? If I go up in the mountains, you there. If I go to the depths of the sea, you there. Every, you everywhere. And here it is, sisters and brothers, there are times that we don't think or we don't feel as if God is with us. But those are the times, sisters and brothers, when God really reveals his presence with us. See, as long as we got a company of individuals, a cadre of friends and relatives around us, they kind of smother out for us you know, our attentiveness, the presence of God. And that is why sometimes we got to be alone in our trying times and in our dark moments so that we can feel the presence of God. God, are you with me is your cry. God, are you near is your call. God is near his people, his chosen people, believers, beloved, who have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. He is present with you. You want to know some simple ways how to usher in the presence of God? Start reading the Bible. Start praying, having a conversation or a talk with God. Start singing or playing some spiritual music, some gospel music. That is how you invite the presence of God in. The reason why we don't experience the presence of God as we should, it is not God's fault, it is our fault. Because God promises if you draw near to him, you, you take some steps in my direction, I'm going to take some steps in your direction. But here he says, if God will be with me, God just told you, I'm going to be with you. Didn't Jesus tell us he would be with us? A few weeks ago, we talked about that out of the Great Commission. He says, and I'll be with you until the ends of the age. Do we not understand what the Hebrew writer says that uh, he said he would be the same Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and consequently forevermore, God will be with us in the times of joy and in the times of sorrow. It's funny how we make that distinction. In our times of joy, it's easy for us to perceive the presence of God because things are going the way we want them to go. But when things get difficult, when the going gets tough, we seem to automatically believe that God has abandoned us because things aren't going the way that we choose for them to go. Sisters and brothers, that's, that's when God shows up the most. You just got through singing and celebrating with the choir, talking about he brought you from a mighty long way. That, that, that right there was an admission that God has been with you every step of the way up to this present moment. 
Some of y'all sat there looking at them like it's just another song for them to sing, but sometimes you need to listen to the words that are coming out of their mouths and let them minister to you. He's brought us from a mighty long way. You got to realize that, that he kept me, never left me, and just say, thank you, Jesus. When you were under anesthesia, he was right there with you. Hallelujah, somebody. When you were falling asleep behind the wheel, he was right there with you. Hallelujah, somebody. When you were walking down the street, clutching your purse, looking over your shoulder for muggers and robbers, he was with you. Through many dangers, Toils and snares, we've already come. The presence of his amazing grace has been with us. God's presence surrounds us. Like the psalmist says in Psalm 34, the, the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that seek him, that love him. We, we, we got a fence. A God divinely installed fence around us, protecting us each and every day of our life. I never get in the habit of saying, the Lord, the Lord, Lord left me, the Lord left me hanging, the Lord left me out there. No, sister, no, brother, God ain't that petty. He's not petty like your friend. He's not petty like your family member. He promised to always... Hi, I'm George Dean of G4. I have a special invitation for you. It's my birthday weekend and the anniversary celebration of G4. Now you gotta make plans to come because it won't be a celebration without you. June 22nd is the Dean's birthday gala. We're celebrating a legend in gospel music. And on Sunday, June 23rd, the big anniversary concert in honor of George Dean and G4. Special guest artists, Little Roy and Revelation. The Douglas Singers. The McDuffies. Josh Miles. Unity of Two. Pastor Austin Hill and Renew. Salem Harmonizers. Sensational Travelers. The Calvin Delights. St. Stephen's Baptist Church, 4245 Singleton Parkway, Memphis, Tennessee. Tickets are on sale now at Eventbrite. Early bird tickets, $20. Advanced tickets, $25. General admission, $30. VIP, $45, which includes one gala ticket. Presented by Eric Anthony and EA Productions and Debbie McLennan and SVP TV Network. So get your tickets now. And I'll see you there. When I got up this morning and I saw a new day, I said one more blessing, Lord. When I got up this morning, I kneeled down to pray. I said one 